gentlemen and welcome back to your International Affairs Forum. Thank you all for being here. We're very privileged to have with us one of the nation's top authorities on the Middle East. Uh, he's been working on the Middle East uh, for decades really and he's written two very influential books about the region, uh, with one of which we have for you tonight. The Middle East can be an area when I talk about it to the audiences here in Traverse City uh, it seems like an area of unrelenting pain and sorrow and difficulty. And certainly right now, millions, millions of people are displaced, are suffering, and are uh, caught in a vice of uh, war and conflict and ideological extremism. Uh, this is a very sad state of affairs, but when you look back to the Arab Spring, the Arab Awakening, it had several names, and you think, well, what happened to those people? Where, where did they go? Where did they disappear? And uh, that's going to be a, a subject that uh, we're going to hear more about tonight. So without further ado, let me introduce and welcome Professor Juan Cole. Well, good evening. Is this on? Okay, you sure you can hear me? I've had students sit through the whole semester and come up to me at the end of the class and say, well, that was a really great class, Professor Cole, but you have a tendency to mumble. And they were the ones sitting all the way in the back. So let me know if you can't hear. Uh, I want to talk this evening about uh, the youth revolutions in the uh, Arab world and uh, especially with regard to uh, the conundrum they have posed for U.S. foreign policy in the Obama administration. Uh, and um, uh, I think there's a real contrast between the Bush administration and the Obama administration in foreign policy, and maybe a counterintuitive one. The Bush administration, uh, had a program of democratization. Uh, and I think it was, from what I can tell, actually quite sincere. Uh, and this is borne out by the State Department cables uh, that we're not supposed to have seen, uh, but which we have seen. And we may have a moment uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for Julian Assange and, uh, and Chelsea. Uh, but um, uh, they really did put pressure on the Mubarak administration in Egypt, for instance, to open up. So uh, I think the Obama administration came in reacting against the muscular interventionist policies of the Bush administration in the, in the uh, Middle East. Um, and I should say that democratization was defined in Washington in those years as uh, elections that led to a government that we liked. Uh, and so those elections that produced a Hamas government in Gaza and the West Bank, you know, after a while they weren't in the West Bank anymore, uh, and so forth. But um, uh, the Obama administration came in, I think, determined to get out of the Middle East. Uh, people forget Obama is from Hawaii. Uh, and if you look out from Hawaii, you see a lot of deals to be made in the Philippines and South Korea and Japan. And uh, you know, we do probably over a trillion dollars a year in trade with the Pacific Rim, the United States. Uh, we do about $400 billion a year with the Middle East, and it's almost all oil and gas. Uh, and I apologize to any of you who have those stocks, but that's wor increasingly worthless. Uh, and so um, uh, I think Obama saw this, and so he wanted to, to move towards, uh, towards Asia. 
uh, from the Middle East, but the Middle East, you know, uh, came and got him and brought him back in and made him, demanded that he have policies towards it. So th there's this kind of irony that uh, Bush went to the Middle East and said, you have to democratize. They said, not interested. Obama went to them as a kind of, you know, realist and said, well, do what you like, knock yourselves out. They said, we're gonna democratize. Uh, so, um, uh, the, you all know that the spark began in Tunisia, and uh, what happened in Tunisia was completely unexpected, and nobody saw this coming. Nobody thought that Tunisia would be influential. Uh, Tunisia is a country of 10 and a half million. In the Arab world, there are nearly 400 million people. Uh, so it's a small, out-of-the-way place. Uh, doesn't have oil or gas. That's why you don't hear about it in our news. Uh, uh, you can name the countries we hear about. Iraq, Iran, they have oil and gas. Then Tunisia, Morocco. Have you heard about any of those? Uh, the, the breaking news on CNN doesn't, uh, doesn't usually come up on, for those countries. But, but this was... And this story was ignored at the time. There was virtually no reporting on it until the last couple days of the revolution in 2011. But it was a youth revolution. And uh, the story is that uh, there was a, a young man who was a fruit and vegetable peddler. And you know, the uh, secret police in Tunisia uh, were horrible. Uh, they're back a little bit now. Uh, but they would just harass people. And uh, so they, the story is, according to his relatives and so forth, that they went to him and uh, wanted a bribe. And he had just bought a couple hundred dollars worth of vegetables, uh, but they wanted a, a bribe. And he didn't have any money to give them as a bribe. He just bought stock. Uh, so they said, well, let's, let's see your peddling license. And he showed it to them, and they took it from him and tore it up. So it seems like you don't have a license. So then his his vegetables were going to spoil, and he went to City Hall, the poor naive thing, and um, saw a lady there, complained that the police had torn up his license and he needed another one. Uh, and uh, she said, you know, you, you, you impudent little thing, and he went over and slapped him. She denies this, uh, but that's what, that's what his family and friends say. Uh, and, uh, well, he was at the end of his rope. Uh, he was kind of the breadwinner for his family. His father had disappeared some years before. He had brothers and sisters and a mother to take care of. So he went and got some gasoline and uh, went in front of City Hall and set himself on fire. Uh, he survived for, for a while, uh, but he was very badly burned. And um, his story was not unique. There had been a number of self-immolations by desperate youth in Tunisia in the previous year or two. But his, for some reason, his story went viral. And uh, the youth in Tunisia alleged that he was a college graduate who had been reduced to selling vegetables. This is not true. He, he was probably a high school dropout. Uh, but but the, the Educated youth in Tunisia face special problems. Uh, their unemployment rate at this point was something like 33%. So it was actually the lower middle class youth or the working class youth who were more likely to get a job. In essence, the, the regime of Tunisia headed by uh, General Zainadine Ben Ali, who had made a coup in 1987, was overproducing white collar workers, and there were simply no jobs for all of those. And uh, so uh, th that a college student had been reduced to these circumstances really tore at the heartstrings of the youth, even though that story is, is not true. Also, um, he was um, known as, uh, his, his real name was Tarek Bu Azizi, uh, but there was another guy who looked like him who had a Facebook page named Mohammed Bu Azizi, so the press got mixed up between the two of them. So he will go down in history as Mohammed Bouazizi, but it was, he's actually Tarek, and he, and he went down as a, as, a, as a college student who couldn't get a proper job, but he was actually not. 
So there are many ironies to this story. The youth were outraged, and all of them had been hassled by the police, and all of them had had trouble getting a job, and so they started protesting. And the protests began in uh, central Tunisia. Uh, it's, the center of gravity in Tunisia is kind of northern and on the east coast, uh, sort of like the United States. Uh, and um, uh, so, but the people out in the center of the country and the south uh, were desperately poor. Uh, there was no particular development plan for them. And uh, the secret police were not nearly as thick on the ground out there. I think it wasn't very desirable posting, so people tried to stay in the capital. Uh, so it was possible to get up a demonstration out there. And so the demonstrations began in these small towns. And, and they were a mixture of things. You know, the youth were protesting the authoritarian character of the government because it was a censorship regime. You couldn't speak your mind. You couldn't protest. Uh, but they were also protesting the lack of jobs. Uh, the Tunisia uh, was, was a French colony, and you know, the French system is very centralized, uh, and so Tunisia has some of those characteristics. So there's a, a national student union. Um, I think the young people in this room should look into that, because I think you, know, you are being stiffed uh, with regard to these uh, uh, tuition prices and loans and so forth. And, if you had a national union, you could maybe like lobby Congress about this. Well, the Tunisian youth had a national student union, both at the high school and a college level. And those chapters out, especially away from the capital, uh, where they were less uh, uh, you know, captured by the regime, those were the ones who, who arranged the demonstrations and brought people together. Uh, ultimately, the protests spread to the capital. It came there very late in the process, and, and it was only really three days in the capital before the regime fell. And this, any historian will tell you, you know, the, you always want to make the people in your capital happy, because those are the ones that can actually physically come to the presidential palace and make trouble for you personally as president. Uh, and uh, so, um, once the demonstrations came to the capital of Tunis, uh, then it, it, it was a very difficult situation, and there was some danger that the presidential palace would just be invaded by a mob of 200,000. Uh, and the, the secret police were shooting people all over the country during this period. Uh, they were ruthless. But the army was small. The president had made a coup, and, and so he was afraid that other officers might get the same idea. So he kept the army so small that it couldn't be the basis for a coup. But then, you know, then you're not overthrown by another officer, but then you don't have an army to use against your people. Uh, and this was his dilemma. So he called in the chief of staff uh, uh, and said, General, I want you to put these demonstrations down. Well, the Tunisian army was only 30,000 men under arms, and there were 200,000 people in the streets of the capital. So it's not clear who wins that one. And the chief of staff is said to have looked the president in the eye and said, Mr. President, I am not going to shoot the Tunisian people for you. Well, if you're a hated dictator and your chief of staff talks to you like that, you may as well just rev up the jet right there. Uh, so not very long after, Ben Ali was in the skies. He was going to go to Paris. And the Ben Ali regime represented itself as secular and uh, would go to Washington and Paris and, and London and, and, and say, you know, there are the Muslim hordes out there, wild-eyed fundamentalists, they're coming for you. What stands between you and them is me. So fork over some billions. Uh, and that's called strategic rent by the political scientists. They, they like euphemisms. Uh, so um, uh, he had a lot of strategic rent for this purpose. And his, his wife, Leila Trebelsi, uh, was a, uh, a world-class uh, uh, social climber. Um, <laughs> Kanye West has a song about people like her. Uh, and uh, she uh, also was the best sister in the history of the world. 
because she had 11, I think, siblings, and uh, one by one she brought them to the president. She had been a hairdresser, and she got a job at the salon that catered to the generals. Uh, it's a very, very clever move. And so she ended up marrying Ben Ali, who was a general who got his hair done there. Uh, and then, uh, she, one by one, she brought her, her brothers and sisters to him, saying, well, you know, they don't really have anything to do, and you should give them some portion of the Tunisian economy. Uh, and so they would get the concessions, you know, the concessions at the airport, or one of them owned the newspapers, or various parts of the Tunisian economy were given out to Leila Trabelsi's uh, uh, relatives. And she put on airs as though, you know, she had gone to finishing school in Paris or something, and she always flew out for the big fashion shows. So um, they were going to go to Paris when they were exiled by the revolution. Uh, but then there are several hundred thousand Tunisians in France, and someone whispered this to then President Nicolas Sarkozy, that maybe, you know, they might mind. Uh, and so there could be trouble about this. And so Sarkozy suddenly said, no, they can't come. So the plane had to turn around in midair, and there was frantic phone calls around the world that who, who wanted Ben Ali. So there's one reliable place you can always send an old dictator, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so the Ben Ali's are in Jeddah, and uh, Leila Trabelsi no longer can show off her fashion. Uh, she's in a burqa. And the, the Tunisians fall down laughing whenever they think about Ben Ali, the great secular savior of the West from the Muslims, is now the guest of the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia. Um, well, these revolutions were youth revolutions. They were staged by the youth. They were planned by the youth. They involved uh, youth techniques like uh, flash mobs. Uh, it, it, once the internet came along, you know, it's possible just to put out the word, hey, everybody, let's show up at the mall at 5 p.m. on Thursday. And you never know, you know, who might show up. And it's a little bit dangerous, these flash mobs, because, like, there was a flash mob in, uh, in California where somebody was trampled to death. I mean, suddenly 5,000 people show up unexpectedly. Uh, it's, it's a crowd control issue. Uh, so, but they used flash mobs as part of their revolution. And what were they complaining about? Well, the, the Arab world had been um, uh, a, a colonial area. France and Britain mainly were uh, the, the colonial masters. And, you know, the colonial powers uh, represented themselves as a civilizing force. The French called themselves, you know, la, la mission civilisatrice. Uh, they were going to civilize uh, the Arabs. I don't know. The Arabs invented algorithms. I think they were civilized already. But um, uh, I, I think, you know, the, fr the French actually just wanted to, like, steal the best land and the best commodities from those places, and they needed a cover story. So they, you know, introduced them to Moliere. Uh, and um, <laughs> I'm not sure that was a great trade. Uh, and uh, so these were, these, and they weren't, you know, set up to be democracies. And a lot of the post-colonial states inherited the colonial apparatus of authoritarianism, and a lot of the same laws are there. Uh, so uh, uh, they weren't nice governments, and they typically, you know, the colonial powers always had a secret police, because who wants to be under somebody else's colonialism? Uh, we didn't like it. Uh, and. Uh, um, so they didn't like being bothered by the police. They didn't like the, the, uh, um, the authoritarianism. But also, the regimes uh, in the post-colonial era, you had had nationalists. Some of them were socialists. Uh, we forget how, how pink the Arab world was. A lot of them adopted you know, kind of a, a communism light as their e economic model in places like Egypt or, or South Yemen. Oh, in South Yemen went communist altogether. Uh, you, you don't think about, you know, the Arabs as having been communists, but some of them were. Uh, and, uh, but these regimes uh, maybe were de developmentalist after the colonialists were kicked out. They esta suddenly established a lot of schools because, I mean, the British Empire really was not interested in having its subjects learn to read and write. Lord Cromer, who ruled Egypt, 
wrote a memo in 1906 to a subordinate. The subordinate said, shouldn't we like found some schools? And Cromer says, uh, uh, no, we did a bit of that in India, and then they formed an association to us out called the Congress Party. We're not going to make that mistake here. Uh, so um, the, the, the Arab world came into modernity, very low literacy rates, not many schools, virtually no industry. Uh, it hadn't been being run for you know, the local people. It had been being run for London and Paris. Uh, and so th these regimes established schools, and they, est they, and they s established uh, state-owned factories since there wasn't a local business class that had that kind of capital. Uh, and they did things for people. And the standard of living in, e in Egypt, you know, the, the average wage of the average worker doubled between 1960 and 1970. People got better off under these uh, policies of, of state-led industrialization, uh, state-led uh, educational campaigns, and so forth. Then the 90s come, and you have the rise of the Washington Consensus, which is having governments do things is, is inefficient and wastes money and certainly doesn't get money into the right people's pockets. Uh, and so uh, you should turn everything over, everything over to the market. The market is all wise, and it will run everything perfectly, very efficiently. Everybody will get what they want. Uh, and, uh, and everything should be marketized, including education and so forth. And Washington and London and Paris had given out a lot of loans to Arab countries. The Soviet Union had fallen. So there was no patron, no model other than the Washington Consensus. And they went to these regimes and said, you have to sell off your state factories. You have to privatize. Uh, you have to stop spending so, money, so much money on free education for people, let them pay for it, and so on and so forth. So from the 90s forward, you had uh, a turn to neoliberalism. And one of the features of this uh, marketization that they don't tell you about uh, in the newspaper articles is that it opens up enormous opportunities for insider trading. Because the government is running much of the economy. In Egypt, the government is running half of the economy. If it's going to sell off part of the economy, they know about it beforehand. So the son of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt would call up his friend, the steel magnate, uh, Ahmed Ez, and say, Ahmed, they're going to sell off the state steel factory. You could buy it up for a song, and then you would have no competition. So not only was it insider trading, but also it had a monopoly effect. So the supposed turn to the market actually was a turn, uh, was a turn to the 1890s age of trusts and, and, and so forth as it happened in the Middle East. Uh, and so the young people, a lot of them were locked out of job opportunities because the elite became so wealthy and so corrupt, and the cronies of the presidents became billionaires. Uh, and if you weren't in that magic circle, uh, you, you were in difficulty. So um, uh, this revolution spread then from Tunisia to Egypt, and that caused a problem for the Obama administration. The Obama administration, like all American uh, uh, governments since, uh, uh, since the 1970s, depended heavily on Egypt uh, to do certain things for us. Mm. They have the best of the Arab armies. Uh, they protect the Suez Canal. They have a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, they're, they're, and, and Hosni Mubarak, the president, Basically, if Washington called him up and said, Hosni, we need you to do X, he would say, yes, sir. Uh, and we were giving them, the United States was giving them, uh, originally it was $2 billion a year. It came down to $1.5 billion a year. Uh, but that's a lot of money over time, over 20, uh, 25 years. Not any sign of it in Egypt. I have no idea where it went. If, if I were trying to find it, I would check in at Geneva, um, because I think the Mubarak's you know, just sent it to secret bank accounts. Uh, but you can't walk around Egypt and see that this money has caused development. Uh, in any case, and, and then a lot of it you know, is just welfare for American arms manufacturers. So 
when, when we say we gave them a billion dollars in military aid, what we really mean is we sent a billion dollars to Seattle for helicopters and, and, and jets, and those are now sitting in warehouses in Egypt. Egypt doesn't actually fight any wars, hasn't for a long time, and so these huge warehouses full of Apache helicopters really don't do anybody any good. Uh, and uh, so it's a very irrational system. But the United States depended on, on Mubarak. And uh, so when the youth of Egypt took a cue from those in Tunisia, and they started coming to downtown Cairo and downtown Alexandria and making trouble, it was trouble for the Obama administration. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Secretary of State, uh, said she was sure that the Obama administration, uh, I'm sorry, that the uh, uh, Mubarak uh, government was stable. I, I think she's a smart cookie and knew that that wasn't true, but she was trying to send a signal that to the M Mubarak that, they weren't, that Washington wasn't going to throw him under the bus. And then poor Joe Biden was, came on PBS and they asked him about you know, supporting dictators and he said, well, I, I don't think it would be fair to call Mubarak a dictator. Um, and, uh, uh, but Mubarak got the same treatment as Zainuddin bin Ali uh, the, the demonstrations did what the political scientists call a cascade, just more and more people came out. And, uh, and, the, and the youth mobilized. It wasn't just through the internet. I went and interviewed the youth activists, and they said they walked neighborhoods. Uh, they kept databases of who opened the door and was friendly. They, they distributed hundreds of thousands of pamphlets, just pamphleteering. And then people told me that they would march in the streets or they would uh, uh, have people chant things from their balconies. Cairo is one of the more dense cities in the world. And if you shout something from your balcony, you may be assured that the neighbors hear it. So if you're shouting, let's all meet at Tahrir Square at 8 p.m., that, you don't need the internet at that point. And of course, Mubarak tried to turn off the internet and it did him no good at all. Uh, in fact, some youth told me that they had to go to Tahrir Square to find out what was happening once the internet was down. So then there were bigger crowds. Uh, so it backfired on them. Uh, and um, uh, the Obama administration supported Hosni Mubarak almost to the last. Uh, it was getting enormous pressure from US allies like Saudi Arabia and Israel to do so. Uh, and um, I said that they didn't want to throw uh, Mubarak under the bus. Uh, but, you know, once the bus had hit him and he was already mostly under the bus, uh, then, uh, then Obama called him and, and, and said, old man, it's time to go. And uh, he, was, he came out on a Thursday about three weeks after the, the, the revolution began. And by that time, he had lost control of the country. The city of Alexandria had become an independent republic. Uh, and it was being run by these youth committees. Uh, the city of Port uh, uh, Said, the city of Suez, these were not any longer answering Mubarak's mail. Uh, and, and if you lose the maritime cities in Egypt, uh, you really don't, you don't have a government. Uh, and um, and it's, it's a danger for the security of the Suez Canal through which a tenth of world trade flows. Uh, so um, uh, Mubarak was supposed to come out on a Thursday afternoon and, and give a speech in which he stepped down. Uh, he gave a very generous speech. He, he actually praised the youth. He said he admired their activism and, uh, uh, and uh, wanted to do right by them, that he wouldn't run for another presidential bid. He would step down uh, before, before running again, and so on and so forth. But he couldn't quite bring himself to, to actually resign. And this was dangerous, because people were expecting him to. Emotions were high. It could have been a real explosion. So the next morning, the, the, the Egyptian army intelligence put Mubarak on a plane out to the Sinai, to Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, and, and, and then the head of military intelligence, who had become uh, Mubarak's uh, vice president, uh, came out and made the announcement that, that Mubarak had stepped down. Youth told me that they, they never had dreamed that they, that they would be able to get rid of, of the dictator. They, they originally, their hope was to dislodge the Minister of Interior. 
in, in these countries, minister, Ministry of Interior is not like ours about trees and things. It's, it's, uh, it's the secret police and torture and, and, and so forth. So there was a very nasty man there that they had wanted to get rid of. So that was their maximal goal originally. And, and to actually change the government was a surprise to them. Well, people ask me, you know, the youth made this revolution. They got rid of the dictator. Why didn't they form a government? And I, I think they just don't um, realize how, how young these people were. They were undergraduates. They were 21, 22. The older of them, you know, who, who kind of headed committees and things might be 30, uh, you know, just on the edge of not being trustable. Uh, and um, so uh, I don't, you can't, they couldn't form a government. In most of these countries, the laws wouldn't have allowed them to run for office, uh, you know, interfere with their homework. Uh, so, um, uh, it wasn't reasonable to expect them to take over having made the revolution. They weren't that kind of political force. A and, and they didn't all agree on things. You know, uh, 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 a mass movement like that swept up all kinds. Of, what, the, that what they could agree on was they didn't want the dictator there anymore, and they didn't want his secret police there. They didn't want all that corruption, and they wanted free and fair, transparent elections. And this is something that uh, is very clear in the leadership of these movements. Now it's, you know, you can poll ordinary everyday rank and file people, you don't necessarily get this result. But if you look at the communiques of the youth committees, the revolutionaries, the people who actually led the stuff, they all wanted free and fair elections. That was one of their central demands. And I can't tell you how remarkable that is as a political goal for them. Because I lived out in the Middle East in, in, the, in the early 70s, and nobody was saying that you know, their dearest hope in life was, was to have an elected parliament. There was the time of you know, Che Guevara and uh, Ab Abdel Nasser, and they, they wanted a man on horseback. They wanted a revolution. They, they wanted things to be changed all around, but they weren't talking about uh, you know, Robert's rules of order. Uh, and, but these, these young people, you know, they're wired, they follow European elections, uh, they, they, they watch uh, satellite television, uh, they, they read, you know, contemporary political theory, and, and that was where their heads were at, I think, the vast majority of them, and it didn't matter, left, right, center, that's one of their central demands, uh, was, uh, was free and fair, transparent elections. The youth who made these revolutions, by the way, were, for the most part, leftists and liberals. They were the kind of people that if were, they were in the United States and were interviewed on television, it would be by Amy Goodman. Uh, that was who made these revolutions. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and a lot of the people who then were elected to parliaments were of the same sort in, say, Tunisia uh, and some other countries. In Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood had been a long-standing oppositional force, and it, uh, uh, it had been allowed to participate in the elections by the Mubarak regime, uh, but uh, not to win big. And uh, now the, the, there were no restraints on them, and they started winning elections. They knew how to canvass, they knew they had a political organization, uh, and they ran rings around these young people. A lot of the young people were basically anarchists, I interviewed the, the April 6th movement, which began as uh, a youth movement that supported labor protests. So it was a blue collar, I mean, a, yeah, a blue collar, uh, white collar alliance. And uh, I asked them in summer of 2011, as, as the preparations were made for parliamentary elections in Egypt, I said, are you walking neighborhoods? Do you have candidates you're supporting? And they looked at me funny. They said, well, that would be something that a political party would do. We're planning the next big demonstration in Tahrir Square. So they were a one-trick pony. They were very good at making demonstrations, but they had no idea of how to get people elected that they agreed with. And I thought to themselves, well, you know, the, the Muslim Brotherhood's going to hand them their behinds, uh, which is what happened. So both in the parliamentary elections of, of late 2011 and then in the presidential elections of, of summer of 2012, the Muslim Brotherhood won. 
It didn't win big. It didn't win overwhelmingly. But it doesn't matter in politics, you know. George W. Bush got to be president, Al Gore didn't. Uh, so the, the Muslim Brotherhood won well enough. Uh, and, uh, but actually, you know, in, uh, in, in spring of 2012, when they had the first round of the presidential elections, they, they did it the way the French do it, where they had like 14 candidates in the first round, and then the two with the biggest vote count would go to a runoff. Uh, among those 14 candidates, 60% of Egyptians voted for leftists and liberals. Uh, so th fundamentalism wasn't where the majority of people's heads were, were at. Uh, and um, nevertheless, as it happened, the pres presidential election of summer of 2012 was be between the, f the, the last uh, prime minister of Mubarak, who was an Air Force general, uh, and Mohamed Morsi, the hardline leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. It wasn't what the youth were going for. That wasn't the choice they wanted. And Ahmed Shafiq, the, uh, the, 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 the elite uh, candidate uh, who represented the old regime, at one point actually said Mubarak was like a father to me. Well, even if it were true, if you were campaigning in a country where angry mobs had overthrown Mubarak only 18 months before, would it be wise to campaign on that? So obviously he lost. Um, but it wasn't that people wanted the Brotherhood in. And the year the Brotherhood w w was, was in power as, with the presidency uh, w was a turbulent year. The youth. Uh, came back out against Morsi. They, they viewed him as a kind of Mubarak with a beard uh, and uh, uh, didn't like his policies. Uh, he, he tried to arrest people for demonstrating, uh, tried to close down media. Uh, he pushed through a, a, a constitution that had some fundamentalist implications. He was horrible on women's rights. He was horrible on Coptic rights. He was horrible with leftists. So uh, he was opposite of everything the youth had been going for in 2011. Uh, and so they started another youth movement against him uh, called Rebellion. And uh, many of them who, who were behind Rebellion had only become politicized by the revolution itself. So they didn't have a long period of politicking and making compromises and alliances. Some of them probably were you know, uh, in, in touch with the officer corps because the Egyptian officer corps is largely secular and they did not like the Muslim Brotherhood at all. Uh, and um, so, um, uh, but I think this was a genuine social movement of youth and workers, factory workers and others, and they came out on June 20th of, of, of 2013 and overthrew Mohamed Morsi. Uh, well, the U.S. ambassador to, uh, to Egypt early in that June came out publicly and, and advised them not to do it. I don't know. I don't think that was wise. Uh, and they, of course, were just angry and didn't pay any attention to her. Uh, and then once there were millions of people, the biggest demonstrations Egypt had ever seen, millions of youth and workers were in the streets on June 30th of 2013, uh, the army came in and said, well, see here, we're not going to be having this kind of turmoil in this country. Uh, Mr. Morsi, you're going to have to compromise with your political foes. And Mohamed Morsi wouldn't have recognized a compromise, you know, if, if it jumped on top of him. Uh, and so he refused. He gave a speech in which he mentioned, because he had been elected legitimately, he mentioned legitimacy 13 times. Uh, and um, so then the army made a coup against him. And uh, ever since then, Egypt kind of had a counter-revolution. So all the Mubarak guys who were put in jail or tried for corruption were let out. Uh, the youth revolutionaries who continued to protest were put in jail. Uh, the, uh, the defense minister of Morsi, who made the coup against him, Abdel Fattah Sisi, uh, a general, uh, ran for president. Uh, his opponents were intimidated, so there was only, only one person brave enough to run against him. He won with 87% of the vote. Uh, this is not a badge of honor. Uh, and. Um, uh, and so now he's president. 
Uh, the Obama administration got caught by all this because they felt they should support Morsi because he'd been legitimately elected, even if he was quickly became extremely unpopular. Uh, so the, the Morsi people think that the, that the generals wouldn't dare have made a coup unless Washington gave them the green light. And then the Sisi people think that it was obvious that, the, that Obama was supporting Morsi uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood because his ambassador said so. So everybody hates me in Egypt now when I'm there. If you tell them you're an American, they look at you sideways. And if they're CC people, they think, well, why were you a Muslim Brotherhood supporter? And then vice versa. Uh, I, any diplomacy that ends up with that result, where everybody hates you, almost certainly is bad diplomacy. Uh, and then the Obama administration said, well, you made a coup. We're going to cut you off with regard to military uh, uh, aid, and which is congressional law. But they only give them the aid in April, and the coup happened in, in July. So it didn't really matter what they were saying in September about cutting them off. And then by the time April came along, the presidential election was in train, and they could certify that they were going back to democracy and, and so on and so forth. So now the Obama administration has just announced that there will be no interruption in military aid. Um, I, you know, I think the United States has ended up looking really mealy-mouthed in all this. And there haven't been, like, strident protests from the American side about the youth protesters, like Ahmed Maher, who was one of the heroes of 2011, now being just languishing in jail, being given long jail sentences, and journalists being tried, and so forth. So things look very dark for this youth revolution in Egypt at the moment. But I, might, I would just remind people, at this stage of the, you know, American Revolution, uh, Revolutionary War, the British still had Staten Island. Uh, and uh, it's, it's early days. And one of the advantages the youth have, and I think they are distinct in their values, is that they are uh, young. Uh, and uh, Sisi is, is my age, and neither of us is going to be around forever. Uh, so uh, uh, they just have to wait now. Uh, but the opinion polling among the Arab youth uh, shows that uh, they're tremendously more literate than their parents. Uh, you know, a place like Libya was 20% literate in 1968. Uh, it's now, among 15 to 30-year-olds, it's 90% it, it's literate. That's a huge revolution in consciousness. And then, of course, now the Arab world has, has the internet, it has free access to all kinds of, of new material. One Arab youth who was interviewed by an anthropologist said when he discovered the internet, uh, he just like down, he, he, I don't advise you to do this, but he pirated movies with subtitles. He taught himself English. And this is something I have found in my interviewing, is you meet a lot of young people that know perfectly good English, and you ask them, well, where did you study? Did you live in London for a while? And they said, no, no, I just, you know, pirated the movies and read the subtitles, and, uh, and they taught themselves. Uh, and uh, one young man said, it was like the internet, you can, you can live an entire lifetime in two years. Uh, and so um, uh, they're, they're much more worldly than their predecessors. They, they, they complain that, you know, they can't talk to their parents because they don't understand. Uh, and uh, uh, th so uh, they, as I said, not, not the rank and file necessarily, but the, the youth activists, the people who, who say that they're acting on behalf of their generation, uh, they have these distinctive values, and, and they do want a more democratic uh, a country. They want more economic opportunity. They're, they're very distrustful of, of uh, nepotism and corruption. And even General Assisi, who's now become president of Egypt, you know there's a new constitution which was provoked by the revolution, which limits him to two terms. And people say, well, you think he really will abide by that? And I say, yes. I, th I think the Egyptian people simply won't put up with presidents for life anymore. Uh, and so I think in many ways, the youth have changed things around. Then I was there in Egypt last year this time. And uh, although there's been this turn to authoritarianism, relatively speaking, from the heady days of 2011, 2012, um, uh, 
the, the workers were striking when I was there, including the postal workers. And Egypt still depends very heavily on land mail. And the army, unlike the old days, wasn't going in after them. Sisi had to do a deal with them. He had to raise their, their wages and you know, improve their conditions and so forth. He needed them. So this is not, you know, some people say we're back to the Mubarak days. It's not like that. Uh, things have changed. And then another finding of the opinion polls is that the youth in the Arab world are somewhat less religious than their parents' generation. In fact, in some countries, it's quite dramatic. So Lebanese youth are like half as religious as their parents with regard to practice. So you ask them, you know, do you listen to the Quran every day? Do you pray? Do you, do you go to mosque? All these kinds of things that people do for religious practice. The Lebanese youth uh, remarkably uninterested. Uh, e Egyptian youth are more religious on the whole, but Tunisian youth, there's a 15-point spread between the youth and their elders. So we hear headlines about these uh, groups like ISIL uh, out on the, you know, the frontiers of where states have collapsed in northern Iraq and in eastern Syria, uh, which are, you know, that's the equivalent of, in the Arab world, of Wyoming. There's nothing wrong with that Wyoming. It's just not very populated. And also, the opinion polling there doesn't reveal the point of view that's common in the rest of the country. Uh, so these places where we're hearing about these, these uh, violent fundamentalist groups are not typical of the Arab world. Uh, and, and, and the way in which Tunisia has, got, has had now two successful parliamentary elections, people have agreed on the, on the rules of the game. There's been serious political compromise between left and right, between uh, 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 fund, fund the religious right and, and the secularists. Uh, that's, that's a really great achievement, and nobody's talking about that. It's in a country of 10 and a half million. The Raqqa province, which is the headquarters of ISIL is, is, uh, in Syria, uh, used to have 800,000 people in it, but about half of them ran away uh, from ISIL. So that's a story about 400,000 people in that province. Uh, and the Tunisia story is not the one we're hearing. But I think the youth profile that we get from the polling is much more like Tunisia than it is like Syria or Iraq. Uh, and uh, I just will finish with the story of uh, Václav Havel, who in 1968 was like 20 or 21 and was running a pirate radio station in which he was denouncing uh, uh, the Stalinists as, as the Soviet tanks were approaching Prague. And the, the, the Czech uh, Communist Party had been experimenting with socialism with a human face and having more civil liberties, and the, uh, Brez, uh, the, the, the Soviets were determined to crush it, uh, and they sent in tax, tanks in 68, and, and Václav Havel was in Prague. Uh, his radio station, of course, was closed down. He was arrested. He uh, was forced out. Uh, he was a playwright, and he was forced out of white-collar work and, and had to work in a brewery. I, I think some of his beers may be classic. Uh, and um, that was a very sad story. That's where, where you found him in, three years after the Prague Spring uh, in the early 70s. Uh, but then by the early 90s, he was president. So I'd keep my eye on Ahmed Maher if I were you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, uh, this is your opportunity to ask questions. Uh, that was a very, very enlightening uh, introduction to this uh, discussion tonight. Uh, you say in your book that uh, this, this generation is seeking dignity and seeking input into the political space, into the process of governing. Uh, but basically, they got neither. Uh, yet you're still optimistic that uh, they're going to go down the path of democracy rather than something more extreme, or are they going to go back on the streets? How do you assess the, the prospects, particularly, let's say, in Egypt? Well, I think once, uh, once a generation learns how to mobilize, uh, they, they don't forget. And um, 
I think in each country there's been a different outcome. Uh, in, in, as I said, in Tunisia they did get, they won't admit it because they, they're the kvetching generation and they're always complaining about how terrible things are, but, uh, but they got pretty much what they wanted in Tunisia. In Egypt uh, they haven't, uh, but as I said it's, it's early days and I think you can't underestimate the degree to which the year of Muslim Brotherhood rule uh, scared the Egyptian people. Uh, it's bad enough having a secular dictator like Sisi, but having a religious one, they really didn't like that. You know, the Egyptians are not fundamentalists on the whole. Um, they, they uh, a lot of them are religious, but you know, they're kind of traditional in their approach. It's not, it's not this hardline fundamentalism. And uh, one Egyptian told me last year this time, they said that the year of Morsi was like he was in jail. Uh, and people really didn't like that. And they chanted, the, the, the two of the Muslim Brotherhood leaders, one was named Katatni and one was called El Arian. And in the villages of Egypt, not, not in Cairo, but out in the delta, in the villages, I found instances where people were chanting against these guys in that year. They were saying, uh, uh, Katatni will El Arian, Egypt won't become Iran. So, that's, that's the attitude that a lot of Egyptians have, and so I think General Sisi is, has got a little bit of um, a grace period going on because people were so traumatized by this prospect of theocracy. But he's got to deliver. And if time goes on and things seem very corrupt and no jobs and, and so forth, uh, they know how to make a flash mob. Thank you. Now, if you will raise your hand, we have microphones available, and if you'll just give us your first name and stand up if you can, and we'd love to hear your questions. My first name is, is Michael, and uh, my question is, will many of those sentenced to, be, to death in Egypt actually be executed? Uh, the, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, Mohammed Badi, who has been a, a sentenced to death, you're asking whether he'll well, actually... Well, many others. I, my, yeah. What I've read in the newspapers is that, is that hundreds have been... Oh, yeah, to... those, that crazy judge down in El Fayum uh, is the hanging judge. Uh, um, no, no, it's gone to appeal, and uh, the Egyptian judges are corrupt and, uh, and not nice people, but they're mostly not that crazy. Uh, so th th those... Uh, sentences that were given against four and five hundred people at a time and so forth, those have been struck down. But there are, you know, people on death row, uh, row for political crimes, for, for basically having been Muslim Brotherhood uh, during the Morsi period. And the Egyptian regime is defining, uh, I, I mean, it, it's like living through our, our zeros again. Uh, they, they've announced a war on terror uh, and they've defined the Muslim Brotherhood as ipso facto terrorists, which they're not. Uh, uh, they're, um, uh, they, ha they had engaged in terrorism in the 40s, but in, in the 50s, but they made a pact with Anwar Sadat in the 70s, and to my knowledge, have, have stuck to it. So it's not fair to call them terrorists, but they are being tried as such, and some of them are being sentenced to death. Uh, and it's not clear whether the regime will actually carry out those sentences. Uh, in Egypt, uh, there's a phenomenon where many more people are sentenced to death that are act than are actually killed. Uh, and uh, I think, in part, this is an attempt to intimidate the Muslim Brotherhood supporters into being quiet and, and letting the coup uh, unroll. You're not allowed to call it a coup in Egypt, by the way. I would get in trouble. Hello, my name is Marion. I'd like to ask your opinion. Um, there is an opposition movement among Palestinian youth and also Israeli youth against some of the Israeli policies. What, what similarities or differences between what's happening there in Tunisia and Egypt and what obstacles do you see to, to that opposition movement? What, do they, what, what are they facing? Right. Well, with regard to the Israeli youth, uh, there was a, 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 a Tahrir movement uh, among the Israeli youth uh, uh, after what happened in Egypt uh, because um, in Israel, uh, as in the United States, there's been a process of neoliberalization, uh, education, other things have been marketized, and uh, there's an a increasingly severe uh, wealth gap between the, the very wealthy and ordinary people in Israel. So 
you know, if you're in Tel Aviv and you're a student, affording an apartment is becoming increasingly impossible, but then if you live outside of Tel Aviv, commuting in for your classes is really difficult and expensive. So the, the students were suffering. At the same time, one of my Israeli friends uh, was boasting to me that they have 18 billionaires in Tel Aviv now. Uh, he, he said, the, the, the Israeli pocket is now deeper than the American pocket. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, there's, there's this extreme wealth division. So that was part of what the, the uh, protests on Roosevelt Avenue were about, that youth set up tents and they were you know, obviously imitating uh, the Egyptian youth. And, uh, but you know, the, the, the advantage the Israeli system has in dealing with youth, youth discontent of this sort is that it does have you know, parliamentary elections and politicians are beholden to constituencies and so they care. And so even someone like uh, Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who's a man of the right in Israeli terms, uh, his Likud party uh, is all for wealth inequality and, and, uh, and, and unbridled capitalism and so forth. Even he recognized the danger to his popularity of this youth movement and so he gave in on some policy issues to make the youth happy and, and managed to settle down that movement you know, which if Mubarak had done that, maybe he, he could have survived, but his regime was sclerotic, not beholden to constituents, didn't have, you know, uh, actual elections and so forth. So I think the Israeli system uh, uh, was able to, to deal with that moment of youth protest because it's more agile and flexible. Um, with regard to the Palestinians, um, there wasn't really a, a big youth movement uh, in response to the uh, Egyptian and Tunisian events in Palestine itself. There was a small movement in Gaza, because Palestine is the West Bank and Gaza, uh, the Gaza Strip. There was a small movement in Gaza uh, of rebellion, imitating the, the one in Egypt, which was uh, youth who uh, adopted a kind of militant secularism and who were criticizing Hamas. Uh, but Hamas doesn't deal well with criticism. Uh, and so after a while, we didn't hear from those youth anymore. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in the West Bank, uh, you didn't really have this big youth movement. I think one of the problems is a lot of Palestinian youth in the West Bank are very unhappy with the PLO and, because you know, these old guys are, are corrupt just the way Mubarak was. And they're also somewhat authoritarian and have cracked down on the Palestinian press. But if you divide as Palestinians and go against them, then that's going to make an opening for the Israelis and the settlers. And, and so I think there's a tendency not to, uh, not to allow your house to be divided. So I think the Palestinian youth haven't been a, as, as vocal and active as those in the rest of the Arab world just because they feel under this pressure uh, from, uh, from the, right, the Israeli right. And I think that also happened in Jordan where uh, I think uh, uh, only the Muslim Brotherhood, which is small in Jordan, really came out in a big way against the king. All the other Jordanians kind of uh, circled wagons. And then when ISIL arose, you know, Jordanians hate radical fundamentalism. And uh, they're, they're, you know, in the Arab world, there are different styles of life, different points of view. And the Jordanians, a lot of them have a Bedouin background. and. Bedouins are free, you know, people of the, they originally they were pastoralists, they would raise sheep and goat and, and, and camels and horses, and they um, don't want somebody telling them what to do. And uh, not only do they have liquor stores in Jordan, but I noticed that they're open all day Friday. Uh, so um, I don't think ISIL has a big chance amongst them. Yeah, I'd like you to comment on an issue as it relates to the youth movements in various countries, particularly if it's a hot button issue right now with Iran and the nuclear focus. Um, they had a revolution too, not too long ago. It was quite significant and it was squashed. But it seemed to come out of that whole revolution that these young Iranians are not the old conservative Iranians of the past. So if you could just comment on what you yeah. expect. 
That's a, a, a wonderful question. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, before the, uh, the events in the Arab world of 2011, in, in the summer of 2009, you did have a similar uh, youth rebellion in Iran. It wasn't nearly as successful. In, in Egypt and Tunisia and some other countries, uh, the youth were able to hook up with the blue collar workers and even some of the business classes who felt like they weren't getting the government uh, contracts. And so, uh, there were a lot of discontented people, even in some instances, farmers who felt like they weren't getting enough water and so forth. So it was a mass movement. That's how Mubarak or Ben Ali were overthrown. Uh, but in Iran, the rest of the society didn't really buy in so much. It was the youth, it was the upper middle class in northern Tehran, Tabriz. Uh, there were some scattered protests in some of the provincial towns, but uh, you know, the following year in 2010, there was a big strike in the traditional bazaars where like the goldsmiths and, and people like that are working as artisans. Uh, but if they had done it the previous summer, it might have amounted to something. But so in Iran, the youth did it one summer and the, and the artisans did it the next. So the regime was able to survive that. But it is true that uh, what the youth were complaining about in part was that they perceived uh, Ayatollah Khamenei to have uh, phonied up the presidential election of the summer of, of 2009 when uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, was up against uh, uh, two or three people who were much more well, first of all, they were much more sensible human beings than he was, but they were also uh, like to his left politically. And, uh, and, and it was felt that, you know, a lot of the ballot boxes came to the voting stations al already filled out. Uh, <laughs> didn't want to tire out the electorate. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so Ahmadinejad won. And he won in places that don't make any sense. You know, one of his, one of his opponents, uh, Karubi, was, is from uh, a, a, a provincial area called Luristan. And Lur is a language and an ethnicity. And Aminujan won 95% of the votes in, in Luristan against a native son. So whatever you think about Aminujan, that's just not plausible in anybody's politics. Uh, and and it, it, you know, the Iranian system is dictatorial, and the Ayatollahs tell people what to do, and, and the, the head Ayatollah Khamenei, you know, he's the head of the armed forces, he's the head of intelligence, he appoints the judges. It's really very powerful. But there is this slim sector of elected office, parliament and president, and up until now, while it's not very powerful, it has always been being conducted in, in ways that pe people felt were upright. In 2009, they felt it wasn't conducted in an upright way. And I think that's one of the reasons that Hassan Rouhani was allowed to win uh, uh, in, um, in 2013, was because uh, he uh, was a kind of dark horse candidate. He wasn't the one that the, the regime wanted. He had been, even 15 years before, kind of a hardliner and had denounced some of the youth uh, uh, demonstrations of, uh, uh, of, of the late 90s. But over time, you know, uh, he, uh, he had moved uh, somewhat to the left, became more moderate. He w had been involved in uh, nuclear negotiations with Europe in 2003 and 4. Uh, and then was sidelined by the Ahmadinejad people who, you know, were right-wing populists. Uh, and um, so uh, he was one of six candidates and I think certainly wasn't the favorite of, uh, of Khamenei, the, 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 the leader. Uh, but uh, people swung to him. And this time they didn't, the, the regime didn't dare interfere. Uh, and so uh, Rouhani came into office and you know, there's a structural analogy a little bit between him and Obama. Uh, just as Obama came to uh, power after a, a period of economic collapse, so the Ahmadinejad period was not good for the Iranian economy. Uh, Ahmadinejad gave out a lot of money in subsidies and subsidies and, and ran up budget deficits and wasn't a, wasn't a good steward of the economy. Uh, and then, um, uh, got involved in foreign adventures and uh, and um, and then had, had without really 
a good reason, had, had alienated Europe and a lot of the world uh, over, uh, over just speaking in an extreme way, uh, and, and including not letting full inspections be carried out of Iran's uh, nuclear enrichment facilities. So Rouhani wanted to reverse all those things. Uh, and uh, so as I said, he moved to the left. He, he wants to get the Green Movement leaders out of house arrest. He wants to make up with them sort of reestablish a kind of uh, consensus in Iran politically. And then, you know, Khamenei and, and all of the Iranian leaders maintain they're not trying to make a bomb. Uh, and former uh, Israeli uh, defense minister Ehud Barak, uh, actually when he was in office, said this. He said, the Iranians have not made that decision to weaponize. They have an enrichment program. It could be weaponized. but but. You know, that's different from deciding to weaponize it. And I, my own scenario is that Rouhani went to Khamenei after he was elected and said, look, uh, you say you're not trying to make a bomb. You say the, the, that a nuclear bomb is the tool of the devil, that it's against Islamic law to make one, to hold them, to use it. Because in Islamic law, uh, it's, it's like, Catholic law of war, you know, you're not allowed to kill innocent civilians, so what would a nuclear bomb do? It kills thousands of them. Uh, so you say this, but you're not letting the, the UN come in and inspect everything. You're not, you're not demonstrating to the West that your intentions are good, and then the West is putting all of these extreme sanctions on Iran, which is hurting the economy, hurting the middle class, endangering the regime. So since you have nothing to hide, since you're not making a bomb, why don't you go to that nice Mr. Obama and say, we'll do a deal with you. We'll let the inspectors in any time they like. We'll, you know, you want us to have fewer centrifuges? We'll have fewer. We don't need that many to make fuel for our reactors. So um, that's my, my scenario of what's going on, uh, that Rouhani is just a much more sensible politician than his predecessor and, uh, and thinks there's not a difference of principle here so much as a kind of wounded Iranian nationalism, and you know, we were humiliated and, and the CIA overthrew our government and so on and so forth, that you just have to get past all that, you know, and get a life. Uh, and, uh, and so we'll see in the next three months whether Rouhani succeeds. Do we have a last question? Yeah. No. Okay, then thank, yes, we do, okay. One last question and then we're wrapping it up, thank you. Um, what's the Egyptian, and I would guess, youth movement uh, view of the events in Gaza? So uh, the, the youth uh, in Egypt uh, universally think the Israelis are being mean to the people of Gaza. Uh, on the other hand, because of their bad experience with the Morsi year and the Muslim Brotherhood, and because Hamas, which rules Gaza, is a was originally you know, a branch of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so the, the, the rebellion youth, the ones who joined to overthrow Morsi, really, really, really hate Hamas. And they want it wiped out. They want it overthrown. So in that regard, you know, they, there's no daylight between them and the Israeli government. Uh, on the other hand, they also don't think the Israelis are being nice to the people of Gaza. So they would make a distinction between you know, people of a neighborhood like Kefaya, which was almost wiped out by Israeli bombing, uh, and we're, we're largely non-combatants, and obviously some combatants were there, which is why it was being bombed. They would say that's a war crime. The Israelis are, are you know, uh, uh, pursuing irrational policies and, 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 uh, and wicked ones. Uh, but, uh, but that the best possible thing to resolve all this would be to, to see Hamas overthrown somehow. Uh, and there are, you know, rumors that the Egyptian military is, is conniving to find a way to make a coup in, in, in Gaza. Uh, so I would say that their, their sympathies are with the people of Gaza, uh, and there are leftists and, 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 and fundamentalists who would even support Hamas, but that the rebellion group, which is probably now the most prominent in the youth uh, political arena, uh, sort of says a pox on both their houses. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Professor Wine Cole. <laughs>